This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. So warm welcome to episode 50 of Demystifying Mental Toughness. Yes, episode 50. It's a landmark episode. And as I've mentioned earlier, if you've been following my social media and in previous episodes, things are going to be a little bit different, certainly for the next 11 episodes through to episode 61. That's right. So what you can expect today is a little recap. So when I set out the idea of putting this podcast together, I wanted it to say what it does on the tin, to demystify the words mental toughness. So in today's episode, three really, really important figures in the mental toughness world that I previously interviewed cut out some really, really important parts. They're really specific towards busting some of these myths around mental toughness. Now, number one, mental toughness despite it being very important, if you're going to be successful, if you're going to perform well, and being helpful towards your psychological well-being and mental health, it isn't always a positive trait. And myth number two, the words mental weakness can often come up in a person's vocabulary when they think about mental toughness. And I want to try and get this message across that mental weakness doesn't exist. It's much more helpful to look at mental toughness on a sliding scale from mental sensitive through to mentally tough. And then that links nicely to myth number three, which we're looking to bust. That it's not a case of you're mentally tough or you're not. It can be developed. It can be developed through experience and coaching. For example, over the last 12 months or so, it might have meant that you would have been on a scale of 1 to 10, a 5 for mental toughness 12 months ago. But now, after coming through some difficulties, some challenges, personally or professionally, around COVID, you might now be a 7. You might be better able to handle pressures. And should they rise again in the next few months or few years, you'll have learned some really, really important lessons that that are going to help you going forward. So yes, in this episode, you're going to hear from some world leading authorities in mental toughness, who've got many papers and many books out between them. You've got Doug Strycharsk, Professor Peter Clough, and Dr. John Perry. And I'm going to stop waffling now, and we're going to get on with the show, where you're going to hear from Doug initially, and then you'll hear some thoughts from myself. It's fair to say as well, if you're, if you're mentally tough, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be successful or your, your well-being is going to be in a, in a great place. Is, is that true, would you say? Yes, that's absolutely true. It, um, well, there's a couple of things there. Is, um, we talk about mental toughness and we tend to use that phrase, but it's actually a spectrum with mental toughness at one end and mental sensitivity at the other. And a mentally tough individual is somebody that's comfortable in their own skin. As things go wrong, they kind of take it in their stride and they know that uh, there will be light at the end of the tunnel and they work towards it. A mentally sensitive individual will respond inside their head differently. It can stop them in their tracks. It can um, knock them sideways. And it can take them a long time to recover from the sort of thing that a mentally tough person might recover from quickly. But it's a spectrum. And what we know is that we all have a degree of mental toughness and a degree of mental sensitivity. And at first, it was hard to see that. And that's why it was important. When we identified those eight factors, what we could find is sometimes you'd find a mentally tough individual, somebody who was clearly mentally tough, getting on with things, making it work. There'd suddenly be a circumstance that stopped them in the tracks as much as it would a mental, what we would call a mentally sensitive person. And what we began to understand is, actually, you can be overall mentally tough, but you might only be mentally tough on five or six of these factors. You might actually be mentally sensitive on a couple of them. And the same is true for a mentally sensitive individual. 
They might be mentally sensitive on most of those factors, but they might well have some strengths in some parts of that framework. But it goes a little bit deeper than that uh, because what's become almost a mantra for us is this term self-awareness because mental toughness in itself is an important and valuable concept but it's an enabler it's an enabling us to understand something about our mental approach if we can understand that that self-awareness then we can often do something about it and so what we know is that a mentally tough individual who isn't self-aware can often have significant downsides. If you've got too high a sense of control, a mentally tough individual can take on too much if they don't understand their own mental toughness. If they too high a level of commitment, and you know, especially if they're in a leadership position, they can actually again take on too much, but can take on too much on behalf of other people and expect them to work hard when maybe they're not ready for it with challenge they can often take too many risks they can push themselves they can you know if you're a salesperson target a market they've actually got no experience in and you come back with a bloody nose with confidence um well if you're overconfident and you're, you're surrounded people who haven't got the same level of confidence you can end up completely intimidating them and you know we've all i guess we've all been in that position where we've come across somebody who's totally dynamic walks into the room takes over a room and suddenly you feel oh this person's got something i haven't got and you kind of shrink back a little well if you've got too much of this confidence that's what can happen and in extreme circumstances an overly confident person can be perceived as a bully so there are potential downsides, but curiously, there's potential upsides in being mentally sensitive. Mentally sensitive individuals bring a different type of creativity to play in a situation. So if you want genuine creativity in an organization, you tend to listen to the people with the loudest voice, and then those tend to be the mentally tough. But some of the really interesting ideas come from the mentally sensitive and we sometimes don't listen to them. So they can bring a, a very special type of creativity to play. And one of the curious upsides of their mental sensitivity is they're also very sensitive to uh, overload, to work overload. A mentally tough individual will tend to carry on going until they keel over. They don't recognize the warning signs. A mentally sensitive individual does. And a mentally sensitive individual can often see that in a team or a group. But again, if you don't listen to them, you don't get the benefit of, of their insights. So it isn't black and white. It isn't labeling. It isn't typing. Um, it is, as you say, what we're trying to do here is try to create the simplest microscope through which we can look at a quite a complex area. But it seems to work. The balance between complexity and accessibility and obviously at the moment we're in the in the midst of a pandemic it's a very very pressurized stressful situation for some people so being self-aware is is such a key factor in being able to make good decisions at the at the moment and some of those traits that you've talked about i would imagine that they're being stretched to, to their extremes oh absolutely and you know, I'd actually step back a little because, you know, we, and for the right reasons, we're really concerned what's been happening over the last three or four months and what might be happening over the next few months. And we tend to have put the current situation almost on a pedestal. It's the great crisis of our time. Well, it is, but it's not the only crisis that people have been through. You know, there are people who go and work for big businesses before, long before COVID-19 came along, that have suddenly crashed. Are those, you know, the people who run those businesses, the people who were employed in those businesses, have had to go through a crisis, it's been pretty severe. You know, if you've lost close relatives in a car accident, you've gone through a crisis that is pretty severe. You know, and I often say, look at the people in Syria. I think they've been living in perpetual crisis for 
for the last 10 years. Look at the people in New York in 9-11. That was pretty, uh, pretty severe. So we actually, when we think about it, most of us experience several crises, big elemental crises, several times in our life. So mental toughness, our ability to deal with that is, is very important. But you're absolutely right. There are a lot of people being tested now in a way that surprises them. Well, I can illustrate it with an example. This is the mental toughness profile for a senior manager in a very big organization, big international organization, and by any standards, he was seen as extremely successful and he built a fantastic team around him, extremely successful. And COVID-19 came along, so who did the organization turn to to handle key projects? They gave it to this character. And this guy thought, right, well, I'm going to be able to deal with it. I've been successful at everything I've touched. In fact, uh, he started to run into trouble quite quickly. If you look at his overall mental toughness, and that he scores seven on a scale of one to 10, that would indicate he is, by general standards, pretty mentally tough. So that would suggest he can deal with uh, crises and is the right person to give demanding projects to. But what we can do, and this is the, the importance of the, the factors, is we look at each of those factors, we can see that on several, on the confidence factors, he scores pretty high. On risk orientation, extremely high. On goal and achievement orientation, high. On life control, the sense of can do, high. You can see why he might be perceived and actually is a high performing individual but and this is pretty characteristic nobody is truly well very few are truly mentally tough and very few are truly mentally sensitive his, his emotional control score is at the other end of the scale his emotional control score is in the 16 percent of the population that is most mentally sensitive in terms of emotional control so what this is showing is he's not as good as most people at managing his emotions and probably allows his emotions to drive some of his behaviours. He's also got, surprisingly perhaps, a low learning orientation score. Now typically what that means is if something goes wrong, somebody with a high learning orientation score, this is where this notion of you, know, you learn more from your mistakes than from your successes comes. Well. If things go wrong, people with a, a learning orientation score at this sort of level will tend not to learn from what's happened. They don't tend to be very reflective. They tend to repeat their mistakes. So why is this person suddenly had a problem? Well, part of the answer lies here, but the other part lies in understanding what else changed for him. He had a fantastic team. That team is now, like most teams, dispersed. They're all working from home. When the team was together, if he had an emotional outburst or had a sulk or, you know, vented his spleen or whatever, the team was so used to it, they would just deal with it. They would actually, in effect, be his coaches. They would take the mickey out of him and say, oh, come on, cheer up. And he didn't need to change his behavior because he got that kind of support from the people around him. Sat at home on his own. It's a different story. That escape mechanism or that coping mechanism isn't there. And similarly, when the coach worked with this individual, bit by bit, began to realise he wasn't as reflective as he thought he was. Actually, most of the reflection happened in the team. They would work through problems, they'd identify solutions, and they'd bring, in, bring them to him. Well, maybe that's you know, good leadership. That's the thing you want to do. We talk about employee engagement these days, but it did mean that. When he sat at home and a problem arose, he really didn't have the kind of inclination or the right approach to be able to reflect on, on the problem. And he found himself sat at home, blips would happen, hiccups would occur, and they would frustrate him and his emotional control would come into play. So these two factors began to interplay. Now, in normal times, the environment and the team play together in a way that this didn't really matter. Suddenly the game has changed and this person is suddenly exposed in terms of two aspects of his mental sensitivity. And that is happening a lot. 
we're getting lots of inquiries from around the world and i would say they fall into three categories the first one is the impact on leaders and managers in exactly this way they're suddenly finding that they're struggling or they're not finding it as easy as before and they can't understand why because they've always succeeded before but part of the answer lies in the way you're approaching it mentally the other is actually from leaders and managers who are concerned about their staff now a lot of people have either been sent home to work in isolation or the frontline staff and they're having to continue to work with a higher risk of exposure to the virus both groups are under stress they're under pressure and both are uncomfortable and if you're mentally sensitive whether you're working on your own at home or you are in the front line and having to get on with a job that you really don't want to be in today because you don't want to catch that virus you can suddenly begin to feel anxiety you can suddenly start to take on the signs of depression and so on and you won't be able to cope with it so organizations are beginning to say i can't actually see my staff every day and i'm hoping that they're doing a good job but i'm sensing that some of them aren't dealing well with the situation how can i assess that and if i can assess it and identify which ones are struggling what can i do about it so that's interesting but you have to be a caring employer to do that but the third one is intriguing me because we do get a steady stream of inquiries and that's people being a little bit more far-sighted and coming to us and saying in three or six months time we're going to get back to normality whatever that looks like and at that point we've got a hell of a lot of ground to catch up i want my staff my teams my employees to come back and i want them sprinting i want them at 100 percent but i don't know what state they're in and i don't know whether they're going to be capable of you know ramping up so quickly but we've got a big job to do so some people are thinking sufficiently far ahead to say actually i'm not sure what state my staff will be in when i pull them back together so doug talked there about mental toughness being an important and valuable concept he talked about the words being an enabler and enabling us to understand something about our mental approach. And again, the words self-awareness were talked about. And the fact is, whether you're mentally tough or mentally sensitive, self-awareness can really, really help you. So I'm gonna go on now to share with you a little tool which you can utilize to improve your self-awareness. And you know whether we're looking at performance or well-being, Self-awareness is all about recognizing something about yourself or about a situation, something that you need to gain control of. And that's exactly what psychology and coaching is all about. So let's think about football for argument's sake. You know, a football coach trying to show a child how to kick a ball that might demonstrate with them, showing them what part of the foot to use. They might also show them how to position their body. They'll likely get the person, get the youngster to experiment. This helps them develop their self-awareness. Now, if you take a situation, let's say you've got to do a presentation, how often do people actually look themselves in the mirror and consider various different approaches that they could take? Perhaps their body language, their self-talk, their dialogue, how they went on to prepare. Often they just tar themselves with a label, I'm rubbish at presentations, or I'm not very good at presentations. Yet with self-awareness, it could be so, so much better. And my job, whether it's an athlete, whether it's an executive, I'm here to help them, to help you become more aware. So I'm going to go on to talk now about what the ideal performance state looks like. So often athletes come to me because they're out of confidence, they're on a downward spiral. I'm generally the last port of call, which means because their confidence is gone, they're feeling anxious and pretty helpless when they're playing their sport in a competitive environment. So my aim is to help them take control of their situation. And I've got a little framework, which I like to use. It's pretty simple. It's called the four T's. And in the four T's, you've got thoughts, tension, timing, and temperature. And in the show notes, there's a handout there 
which can guide you and, and help you. So we'll start with thoughts. I've mentioned in a previous podcast about my Billy. That's right. I've got a little friend called Billy on my shoulder who likes to chirp in my ear. So if you are on the top of the scale in terms of thoughts, your Billy would be chattering away 100 mile an hour. There would be a lot of clutter in the thinking there. That would be a 10 out of 10, if you like, for thoughts. Whereas the very bottom of the scale, you would be very, very quietly minded. Not a lot of thinking would be going on. You'd be pretty much on autopilot. And then if we think about tension, tension on a scale of one to 10, 10 would mean that your body is really, really tense. Or certainly a specific part of your body is. Say your shoulders, they might be racked with tension. Whereas at the bottom of the scale, you're likely to be very, very relaxed. You wouldn't experience any bodily tension whatsoever. Now timing, at the top of the scale for timing, I'm sure you've seen people who pace around really fast. They might speed up their talking. Their walking might be super fast as well. That would be the top end of the scale, which in sport can affect their motor control. And in presentations, you'll have seen it where someone opens at 100 mile an hour. That's them. That's that type of person. Whereas the bottom end of the scale, it's someone who's fully in control, taking their time. It looks like they're out out for a stroll in the park. They're not rushed whatsoever. And then temperature, this is linked to your adrenaline levels. So at the top of the scale, it will be someone who's perhaps really excited or really, really angry. Whereas at the bottom of the scale, it's someone who's supremely calm. They might even be bored, which isn't necessarily a good thing. I find this process is so, so helpful for athletes, for performers. Talking through this process, they can really get to know themselves much, much better. And then they can go on to fine tune what it is that they need to do in order to get themselves in a much better place mentally to perform at their best. And as I mentioned, you know, this tool doesn't have to be used solely for performers. It can be used on a day-to-day level too. If you're feeling overly stressed or out of sync, if something has happened in your life, you might be struggling, you may have been promoted or transitioned into a new role in the workplace and struggling to get to grips with that. If you go through this 40s framework, it can have a massive, massive impact on you if you're willing to then look yourself in the mirror and make a few little changes. Often what I find in sport and working with executives, a lack of awareness is generally because people get so, so focused on the end result and what they need to achieve. And they go on to forget about the process involved. For example, a golfer who's trying to pitch a ball from point A to point B, perhaps over some over a bunker or over some water, They worry themselves so much about the outcome, about trying to hit the perfect shot. They worry about the bunker, the water. So in terms of trying to execute a skill, this awareness and control, so taking control of the situation, adjusting your thoughts, your timing, has a massive part to play in skill acquisition and, you know, in life in general for that matter. We've touched on how mentally tough people can get caught out, taking on too much, perhaps burning themselves out if they're not self-aware. And in the next segment, with Professor Peter Clough, he's going to go on and elaborate that little bit more, as well as touching on the differences between resilience and mental toughness. Quite a lot of variants. It does a job, but it's it's, it's by no means the answer. Mentally tough, when we've done a study, mentally, for example, marathon runners are more mentally tough than um, people who don't take part in extreme exercise. But then surgeons, for example, are even tougher. So, so sometimes it, 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 it's, it's what people think is tough isn't tough. What people think is sensitive isn't sensitive. And uh, yeah, hopefully our model helps explain behaviour. I suppose the other thing as well in that you, you might be a marathon runner or a surgeon and be mentally seen as mentally tough but then that isn't necessarily going to be a positive thing for your life if you haven't got self-awareness yeah absolutely and i'm working at the moment um just been talking to, to colleagues about so mental toughness master classes looking at 
development for the mentally tough. Because you might be mentally tough, but then, yeah, they're not perfect. Mentally tough people aren't perfect. They can withstand pressure well. They have an advantage in, in these difficult times, but they're not, yeah, they're not the end product. And sometimes if you're really mentally tough, you might not explore some of the other ways of doing stuff. Because what you've got works. It works well most of the time, but the world has suddenly changed. And, yeah, we're doing some research into looking at in post-COVID or actually during COVID because we're, we're struggling to get post-COVID, is um, some of the realities we thought were realities might not be. So a mentally tough person can can cope with change, but yeah, as you rightly alluded to, it's about does that mean that they're going to change themselves? So yeah, self-awareness is key. But yeah, working with the mentally tough to make them broader is a challenge in itself. It's a good, it's a good challenge. It, we're not saying if you're a, a, a ten in mental toughness, you're a finished product. I mean that that's really important. You're not saying if you're a one, if you're really sensitive, there's something wrong with you. It's understanding what you are and then working with what you've got. Yeah, yeah. Because you could be like very high on commitment and a very confident person. Was yeah high on the challenge element, and then you so you end up like overloading yourself and saying yes too many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. For example, with that mentally tough people deal with stress more effectively. You know, generally across the board, um, we see we see that time and time again. But then they can sometimes snap. You know, it's the famous bending in the wind. If you're a sensitive, emotional soul, everything's chaos. Everything's worrying. So you get used to it. If you're a mentally tough person something like a, a significant bereavement can completely topple them because they've never had to deal with those those feelings of being out of control. You, know, you can't control everything. So, yeah, the, there are limitations to every model, to every psychological variable. And we come back to that, it's understanding yourself. We, we always come back. If you know what you are, you, you know where your limits are, you're pleased with what you've got, but <laughs> you, want, you, want, you want the other side. Whatever coin you are, yeah, mentally tough people, develop sensitivity sensitive people become more mentally tough great but it's um it's a constant it's a constant move forward often you find people compare resilience with mental toughness and i suppose they tar it with the same brush how, how does it differ well i mean it's one of the key aspects guess, is, is probably the question i get asked most often um but resilience is to some extent, it's, a, it's an old-fashioned term, and that doesn't mean it's bad, you know, because our psychology is based on 40s, 50s, 60s psychology. Um, but as we've seen, the world changes, and resilience is a passive term. It's about, and even by its own definition, and there's lots of different definitions, and there's really good research going on. So I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing what people do. You know, we can explain what, what I do, but in a resilience sense, it's about surviving pressure it's about dealing with the horrors until it goes away yeah you know, it, and it's an engineering term it's like a bridge yeah you know, if it's resilient it ain't gonna fall down in a big wind but that doesn't seem to me to capture what the human experience is some people prosper under pressure uh, some people seek out pressure and actually most people are, are more scared of brownout that's rusting away because life's so dull than they are burnout yeah so we don't avoid stress Nobody I know avoids stress. You could do without it sometimes. <laughs> on a Monday morning, that, that's really bad. What's going on? But we're not that stress averse. We, we're really not. You know, we seek out challenges. People do, and resilience can't really explain that. You know, why would a, resilience is about, as I say, surviving the wave hitting you? But so actually, quite, mental toughness is out going, going to see the wave. So it's quite a reactive term than resilience in comparison to mental toughness. <laughs> Yeah, mental toughness is proactive, positive psychology is dealing with it positively, you know, maximising the bang for the buck in stressful situations. And more than that, it's that classic that people, there's an easy way of making a living, there's an easy way of relationships. We don't tend to take those. So the example I always gave to my undergraduates was, you know, if you've got the same money stacking shelf in Tesco, which is a, a good job, you know, there's lots of reasons, um, why that? Or being a, a clinical psychologist with all the exams, all the pressures, all the things, what would you choose? And people would choose a more stressful job. And then if you say you got paid twice as much stacking shelves at Tesco, which you clearly wouldn't, they'd still choose the, the most stressful job. So, yeah, we, we live in a world where you think stress is a bad thing and it isn't. It's not great now. And 10% of people have 
psychological conditions. You know, if it's, it's clinical anxiety, clinical depression, it's outside my remit or my, my technical expertise. But most of us put ourselves in stressful situations. And so that, that didn't make sense to me as a, a concept. So it's about survivability. And if you think about tie that into um, what we're experiencing at the moment, you know, we, we can sit in our rooms and survive, but actually the bit that we're missing is the other stuff. Yeah, if, if it was just about ducking for long enough, there wouldn't be any psychological issues. And there clearly is a lot of psychological issues. People want personal contact. People want development. People want a change. So resilience doesn't really, if you think about it, match up to what's going on at the moment. People yeah, people are keeping out of the way, but they're unhappy. But they're getting paid often, yeah, and there's stuff, but they're still unhappy. So it's more than that. Yeah, The, hu- the, the human spirit is more than just simply keeping your head down. So in some ways, with this pandemic, mental toughness, if, it, well, if you want to develop mate, your mental toughness, you're more likely to thrive right now as opposed to certainly the resilient person. Well, I mean, the resilient, there's risk, yeah, because I, I review papers and we've got a paper just coming through the system and hopefully that'll be out in the next couple of weeks, depending on, as they always say on these uh, media broadcaster, peer review. It's in a peer review process. It's got, and what we find, you know, that there's resilient people and, and mentally tough people, let's talk about our own research, the mentally tough people have had a less negative impact or the, the pandemic's had less impact on them than the more sensitive people. You know, it, it's clear their well-being is higher. It's still lower than it was, so it's allowed them, but then it's about talking to people, planning ahead. You know, some people have functioned really well in lockdowns. You know, it's, it, it's never that simple. But, you know, some people have, have set up businesses, they've done all sorts, and it's a different mentality. If you take resilience, you get a big tick for just hanging in there. Mental toughness is about de- dealing with what you've got and moving forward in these difficult times. So it's a lot easier said than done. You know, I'm, I'm as vulnerable to, to media, and the uh, best definition I've seen at the moment is it's just sad. Everybody's just slightly sad or really sad. It's the only two options you've got. But within that, some people are moving forward some people have stopped so resilience would would predict yeah people would have less issues mental toughness is trying to pick up people who are actually moving forward in the in these difficult times it's not about prospering in uh, under misery but it's about um seeing things in the whole yeah no it makes a lot of sense because i suppose if i think about certainly the six months or so with conversations i've had i've seen like some people, we think about confidence levels, how because of the situation, they haven't necessarily been able to do what they wanted to do. So their, their confidence and their belief in themselves dipped. Their, yeah. Yeah, people who in the workplace, because they haven't had that face-to-face contact, they're, and they haven't been able just to offload and like talk as they would do, their emotional control has been pretty erratic to say the least those sort of factors come into play yeah and it it, it, it takes that three-dimensionality of human behavior because you know not one of my papers that i've just been reading one in review and uh, the, the introverts of the world are really quite happy they're happy they're happier than they were before so it, it's never that simple is this bad you know it's bad on a, a physical level it, it's mm. bad on infections and deaths and economy is really really bad but some people are okay you know does it affect everybody well not if you're not a a social person if you are a social person there's there's a real problem and if you talk about confidence um which is really important a mentally tough person is more self-referent they they, their confidence is internal so it shouldn't be as dented but if what you rely on is is positive praise and other people being nice to you and saying stuff yeah this is really difficult but the core of confidence is that self-belief which as the term says, you know, it's self, it, it, it's you thinking it. So every every text hits, but what what we thought, and yeah, I think yeah, we're great believers in, in self-awareness, but, you know, people who appear confident at work often appear confident because they're bouncing off other people. If you're on your, in the room on your own thinking deep thoughts and thinking, am I going to get out of this? Is, is, yeah, is there a way forward? That, that, that's, that's the real steely confidence. And mentally tough people are less dependent on other people giving them warm strokes uh, so yeah that that is an issue um 
but you know if you're a if you're an extroverted sensitive person these are really 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 difficult times i can't put enough realies into it but if you're a mentally tough introvert yeah so, so yes yeah, so really what you're saying there is mental toughness does explain quite a lot of the i suppose the problems predicaments people are in but not not everything because yeah whether you're so your environment's the other big thing whether you're socially uh, well, yeah, I, I mean, in psychology, so yeah, sometimes we we get over, over overly focused on on psychology. Do we psychologists? Oddly enough, but you know, <laughs> it's about it's about money and uh, your kids and, and various stuff. So there's a lot going on, but within that mass of uh, stuff going on, we still find a real solid finding is this paper in review that um, the mentally tough people well being hasn't dropped as much as the sensitive people. It's tweaked a bit, but they're still yeah they how long that can be. And again, if you go back to the original question about resilience, resilience, there's a finite time. You know, if, if it's a really windy day, blowing a bridge, you can survive that. You can't survive that for six months. They fall down. So resilience has no answer to um, continued stress. It's, it's not designed for that thing. It's about surviving short-term pressures like exams or breakup of marriage or whatever it is it, it can deal with that quite effectively it can't deal with a constant stress uh, where mental toughness should be able to yeah you know, and again there's some questions yeah you know, we're exploring as does it is a key question and does people mental toughness change in these difficult times you know what, what's going on around and out there but it, it is able to cope with this you know this has been this is going to be a year or a year and a half I don't know of any resilience models which can effectively deal with that. They're, 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 and they're right, you know, they're used a lot in sport because it's about surviving the 80 minutes or the 90 minutes of a, of a penalty shootout, and that's really important. And they're really well suited to that, but they're not as well suited to this long-term pressure. I'm pleased to announce a new sponsor for the show, Chimera Sport who produce a range of sportswear and equipment to enhance performance and recovery, reducing injury occurrences. You'll find on the product section of our website, www.sport-excellence.co.uk backslash products, access to our own Chimera Sport Shop. I've personally tested some of the garments and you'll find that the infrared sportswear has been clinically tested too. So it's great for fitness enthusiasts and athletes who want to push harder, go further, and recover quicker. As Peter discussed, we all have blind spots. Regardless of whether we're mentally tough or mentally sensitive, we have some good habits and we have some not so good habits. So let's consider around the house someone who's very tidy, very clean. If we think about their habits, they might hoover, they might use cleaning products, they might use bleach, things like that. They may well do it on a daily basis, maybe for 15, 20 minutes per day. And if that 15, 20 minutes turns into two hours or three hours per day, arguably some people might label them as having OCD or characteristics along those lines. Whereas the person who spends 15 to 20 minutes per week by some people may be considered someone who just doesn't value tidiness or cleanliness in their home. In this respect, it's all about striking a nice balance and being more aware of actually what you do and what's helpful, what's not so helpful. And that's much the same around life, sport, your business life. So I'm going to continue this theme where we're going to think about developing your awareness, how we can do so. And if we consider peak performance or optimal well-being, being aware of our own experience is very vital it's hugely vital. It helps us control our energy, any excitement or nerves. If we get aroused too much, it helps us reorganize things. So imagine, I'm sure we've all been there when we've been bored, we've been pretty low. If you're more self-aware, you can find ways to reinvigorate, reactivate. It might be by doing something a little bit daft and having a dance or having a sing-along in the car, something like that. Those are little strategies that can help you. So now what I'd like you to do is just consider your mental toughness profile, your mental toughness personality. And I'm going to break this down into the four C's. Commitment, challenge, confidence, and control. And I'd like you to consider the pros 
and the cons of being a highly committed person, someone who's really motivated, really driven, and spends a lot of time chasing their goals in comparison to someone who's not committed at all. That's right, I'd like you just to consider the pros around both the highly committed person and the person who's not committed. And likewise, let's look at challenge. Someone who's a risk taker. Again, someone who plays it very safe. Confidence. So someone who's overconfident. Perhaps someone who's a touch arrogant against the person on the other side of the fence who's underconfident, doesn't believe in themselves enough. And then lastly, control. That's someone who feels in control of their destiny. They're focused and have a can-do attitude against the person who feels helpless and can't control anything. You're going to find in the show notes this exercise broken down onto a sheet there, which is going to help you. And really what I'd like you to do is give yourself five or 10 minutes to think about this. Make a few little notes. Think about which categories that you fall into. Think about friends, colleagues, family members, and the categories that they fall into, what they go on to experience, what you go on to experience on a day-to-day level. Consider normal days where there's no pressure, or maybe not so normal days at the moment where there is pressure and stress. Consider events or performances when you're overly stressed, or you're certainly stretched anyway. And think about your thoughts, your emotions, your actions, and how it goes on to affect you internally in your body. Simply by doing this exercise, it's going to improve your awareness of your mental toughness. And even if you're one of those people that Peter mentioned, who is very, very mentally tough, you're going to find this helpful. Just like the person who's in the middle, whose mental toughness levels are are pretty average, they're going to find it helpful. Likewise, the mentally sensitive person is going to find this helpful. It can help all people simply take some control, some ownership over their actions and give themselves a better, a fresh perspective. And speaking of fresh perspectives, next is Dr. John Perry, who's going to share some of his thoughts on the topic and how learning can actually take place, how you can go on to develop that self-awareness a little bit more and why it's so important do some work in an education setting or a health setting or a business setting or something. That's why I kind of always have this love for sport because it's, because I I think that's where it's kind of most visceral where that kind of thing happens. And one of the big advantages I feel of sport is that it's so unique in that sense in that it creates those situations all the time. As a researcher, it's, it's like having a lab for you with these kind of controlled, contrived conditions where people are met with uncertainty because that's the point of sport to create uncertainty because that's where the excitement comes from. So we can see how they respond to it and we can see what works well and what doesn't work well for different people. And then we can take that and we can use that in, in different circumstances. As we go on into 2021, naturally 2020 has been a tough year for a lot of people with, uh, with COVID how does what you've just talked there about sport translate into just everyday life and helping people go on to to move forward to prosper in 2021 yeah it's a it's a good question i i think with with, with sport and with any sort of performance context what we see a lot of is the majority of people actually strive to put themselves into stressful situations People like being outside the comfort zone. People like um, developing in that respect. And, and that, that doesn't matter whether it's sport, whether it's recreational exercise, whether it's someone's career, whether it's relationships, whether it's playing on a computer game, whatever it is. This, we, we have this sort of natural drive to kind of live on the edge of our comfort zone. Now, some people have that more than others some people love to live actually quite a little bit beyond um and they're the they're kind of the wild card types and some people actually prefer to be slightly inside but even the most cautious people are actually they're, they're still looking to develop they're still looking to get towards the end of that in terms of what we can what we can learn from from sport is i think it's the the longevity of that progression that's one of the things that and I'm sure you've come across this as well, that if you work in sports psychology 
you'll often have approaches to say, can you come and work with this team or this individual or whatever? Because we've got we've got some playoffs coming and we want to perform well. And you go, yeah, sure, I'll bring my magic wand. And <laughs> um, whereas actually what we want to do is we want to develop, we want to see sustainable developments that last. And essentially as the psychologist, you, you make yourself redundant. They don't need you anymore. They're able to... They're able to, to take those skills forward. And uh, and what we see in sport, and I'll go back to my being a Grimsby Town fan, one of the things it does do is it teaches you that, that failure and disappointment is a, is a consistency in life. And encountering that and then moving on and learning from the experience. And in sport, you do it all the time. It, because it, regardless of what sport it is, whether you're successful, or whether you're unsuccessful, next tournament, next match, next competition, that actually doesn't make a whole pile of difference. This is a new one and it goes again. And I know you like golf. One of the one of the things I love about golf is if you play a bad shot, your next shot's a new opportunity. And if you play a good shot, the game has a very, a very nice knack of making sure you don't start getting carried away with yourself and thinking that you're, <laughs> that you're really the bee's knees because you've played one good shot. Um, so in playing sport, either within the game or in matches or tournaments, we regularly encounter these highs and these lows. And the thing I take from from it that I think can impact in every day, everybody's lives is in a in a less obvious way, and maybe a, the, the peaks and the troughs aren't quite as high or as low in everyday life. But that's the key to it. It's the longevity. We, we don't experience many things that are a one-off once in a lifetime. We have good days, we have bad days, we have an awful lot of in-between days. And the easiest thing to do is to keep on coasting through them. And we do that in, in relationships. Um, and relationships kind of lose a spark. We do that in with our health. You know, you have a moment where diet starts Monday, you get yourself fit and healthy, or new year, new me, you know, in January, we're all thinking about that kind of thing. Um, and then we start cruising and we go back into autopilot. Now, high sports performance doesn't let you do that because you've got these really regular objective outcomes of how well you did that force you to reflect and force you to learn as you go. And I think if you can kind of, on a lesser level, bring that into your everyday life. So if I wanted to get myself fit or eat healthier or do better at work or do better in college or whatever it was, if I can force myself to have these kind of regular reflections, okay, well, I, I did this or I failed to do that. Why? You try and make meaning of that experience. Try and think. And it doesn't have to be a major thing. It can be a very minor thing. It can be a, oh, I said I wasn't going to have a takeaway. And then it got to Friday night and I thought, so I'll have a takeaway. Um, you can still make sense of that. You can still make meaning of that. Well, why did I do it? There was a reason behind it. Because that's what we would do in elite level sport. Yeah, and that I suppose that comes like naturally to some people, but but not others. I know some of some clients I've worked with um, they've been like highly talented, highly skilled, and like one of the frustrations has been that they've just kept on making the same mistakes and repeating mistakes and not learning from those. What would you say to that type of person? Yeah, well, they 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 can be a real challenge when that's the case. Um, but I, I, I always feel there's reflection is a very difficult skill. Developing self-awareness is very difficult. For some people, it comes naturally. For some, as you mentioned, it, it doesn't. But it's, it's a workable and a developable skill at all times. And, and it's funny because when we talk about things like developing mental toughness, in a sense, the development of mental toughness is almost the outcome of it. You kind of de- you develop the skills through reflection, through self-awareness, whereby you you try out new things, you learn from different situations, you understand why you felt that way, why you reacted that way in a certain situation. And then over time, when you encounter future situations, you'll start to respond in a more mentally tough way. Now, when you have those individuals where that middle pin is, is missing, we have to kind of think about the language we use, for example, you know, reflect. Nah, 
that's you know, imagine talking to a 19 year old lad who just wants to be a footballer. You know, let's start talking about personal and self reflection. Does doesn't work. So the language we use, I think, is really important. The kind of core psychological skills that we might use, counselling skills, being comfortable with that silence, creating that that awkward silence, asking a question and not feeling like you need to answer it. And even if they don't answer it, it's okay. Let it linger. I I, I think one of the things one of the things I've learned over the years, and that's not to say I've, I've mastered it by any means, um, is patience when you're trying to sort of get this development. I, I think early on, you kind of feel like you want to be seen to be making a difference, like you're earning your, your money, so you kind of start to intervene. And you, you almost try and do the, the, the performer or the, or the client's job of the responding and the thinking. And I think having that, that as, a, as the coach or consultant, having that confidence to say, okay, well, it, it's not actually about this session having a particular outcome, this chat having a particular outcome. And it's okay if it's awkward and it's okay if the silence is and it's okay if, if this individual right now doesn't see the value in, in what we're talking about. But just let it linger, let it be a bit awkward, let them go, ask them next time. Did you get a chance to think about that at all? Have another awkward meeting and you kind of never try and rush it and never try and force it. And I, I know myself, I was very guilty of that early on when I kind of thought, right, I'm the psychologist. I, I need to, I need to do something. I need to, you know, I think just having that patience and enjoying the, the awkwardness and the silence and, and, and waiting. So I'm assuming now that you've got this far, you've listened to Doug, you've listened to Peter and John share their insights into mental toughness, into the importance of awareness, self-awareness, and how mental toughness can be developed. You've also heard my pearls of wisdom, and I'm hoping you're going to go on and listen to the next few minutes. I'm hoping that you're going to do some of the exercises that I've mentioned, or certainly give it a lot of thought or a bit of thought even. So now I'm going to highlight again, you know, why this is so important. And by doing so, I'm going to use the analogy of traffic lights. So when you consider in everyday life, in sport performance, music performance, business performance, whatever it is, it's very similar to driving a car. Most of the time, when you're driving, you don't think about changing gear. You don't consider how you need to turn the steering wheel. You're an autopilot. Yet when we arrive at traffic lights, we need to be aware of what colour the lights are, red, amber or green. And then we have to act accordingly. Ideally, you're going to stop at a red light. At green, you'll simply continue in autopilot. And I'll let you decide what you're going to do at amber. The important thing is, though, that you do have a decision to make. Similarly, in life or sport, we often go through periods when we can simply continue as we would do with green and not get into thinking. Then there are times when we hit amber, where we've got a decision to make. And then lastly, when we hit a red light, when stopping and spending some time to change our approach is vital. So I'm going to encourage you now to spend some time just considering whether it's in your life, your work or your sport, what are the red, the yellow and green lights for you? What activity goes on? When you hit that red light, what situation is happening? What happens to your arousal, your self-talk, your posture, your breathing, your confidence, your focus? Consider some situations where you hit a green light and you just continue through without even thinking. By doing this exercise, it's really going to help you understand your experience, your experience of different situations. It's going to help you consider what are potential stressors. What are the situations you need to be aware of where you need to check in and adjust your approach? Lastly, it's a big, big factor in helping build your resilience to be able to handle difficult situations. Because let's be honest, life, sport, business is not a straightforward journey. And on this notion of handling difficult situations, challenging situations, 
bumps in the road, obstacles, I'd like to draw to your attention. Today, I've released an accelerator course, an online course to help you achieve your goals faster, specifically in 60 minutes. That's right, in one hour, you'll be able to go through a range of exercises and tools that can assist you in your sport so that you can move the needle, you can get a boost, you can accelerate and get the most out of your time and your talents. So check out my website, the three w's.sport-excellence.co.uk backslash products. This course is available for a short period of time. So get in there quick to go on and help yourself. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sport psychology resources. Sport-excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams. Or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.